Hello, welcome to Zoonosis with Joy. I'm Joy, and today we're going to be talking about hybrid vigor. This is a concept that is related to agriculture, society, and to one of my favorite animals, the mule. Stick around if you want to learn more about this concept, and leave a comment and a like if you enjoyed the video. Uh, so, when we talk about hybrid vigor, it's also known as heterosis, which sounds like an STI for straight people, but essentially what it is, is when you take two individuals who are purebred, and you cross them together to form a hybrid, that hybrid will often have qualities that are superior to both of the parents. So this is related to some interesting genetic phenomenon. Now, think back to high school, that may be a long time for some of you, um, but if you remember, there is often a dominant and a recessive version of a gene. Now we are what's called diploid organisms, meaning we have a pair of chromosomes for all individuals. And what this means is that you can often have a pair of both a dominant and a recessive gene on your autosomal chromosomes. You can also have a pair of dominant genes that's called homozygous dominant, or a pair of recessive genes that's called homozygous recessive. What's interesting is if you have a pair of dominant and recessive genes, that's called heterozygous individual. And in many cases, it shows up as the dominant phenotype. This is called the dominance phenomenon, and when we see that, it actually can be a superior trait, in many cases, to the purebred individual, which may have recessive genes. The recessive phenotype is often a loss of function, so you are losing access to that gene if you have a recessive individual. You can also have what's called overdominance phenomena. If you have two dominant genes together, they often can form an unhealthy phenotype. So having a dominant and a recessive is a nice balance. That's called the overdominance uh, phenomenon. You can also have modifier genes from other parts of the genome interacting with that gene. And when you get them from two purebred individuals, you may have a very nice mix of that. And that is called epistasis. With all three of these things together, the dominance phenomenon, the overdominance phenomenon, and the epistasis phenomenon, you can have an individual which has superior traits to those of other organisms. This has been well documented in cattle and corn. Um, in cattle, we know for sure that uh, individuals that are uh, uh, hybrids, uh, they will have better rate of gain, they have, often have better reproductive uh, potential, and they can often have many different carcass quality improvements uh, compared to other breeds. So this is important for beef cattle um, breeding, and it's also important for plant breeding too. But when you think about hybrids, you may not be thinking about cattle or corn or other kind of agricultural products. One of the most well-known hybrids is actually the mule. Now, mules are very interesting. They're actually a hybrid animal which does not exist in nature. They are a cross between a mare, and a, which is a female horse, and a jackass, which is a male donkey. And when you breed them together, um, you produce an animal that is called a mule. Mules are well known for many different traits, which is a result of what's called hybrid vigor. Um, so some of these traits include that they tend to be smarter than uh, horses and uh, uh, donkeys. They have been demonstrated to have improved cognition and uh, on visual discrimination tests. Um, they're known for being able to remember people and remember commands, which often gives them a reputation for being stubborn or aggressive because they learn what they can get away with and they learn um, not to tolerate uh, abuse or neglect like some horses or donkeys might. Um, they often have superior muscle endurance to horses and donkeys, and this seems to be related to both the dominance phenomenon and as well as the overdominance phenomenon that I mentioned. This makes them excellent working animals for plowing, as well as for mountainous terrain and other kinds of workhorse sort of things. Work mule, I suppose. Um, mules can also have some other traits which have been less scientifically verified, but seem to have some interesting facts uh, behind them. Um, so they're often said to have superior stature to donkeys, and this has been demonstrated. They, uh, um, they often are more closely related in height to horses. They're not taller than horses in height, but they tend to be much more like the horse, uh, the mare side of their family. Um, they seem to have a longer lifespan, and it's not quite clear how, how true this is, but there's been reports that they've reached extensive ages over the age of 50, which I don't know if I buy that, but they can live a very long time. Um, there have uh, been reports that they can subsist on worse fodder uh, than other kinds of uh, um, horses and doggies. Again, this might be the fact that they have superior muscle endurance than either of those. Um, but that being said, the mule is kind of an interesting animal because since it does not exist in nature, it is completely dependent on human beings for its production. Why doesn't it exist in nature? Well, for one thing, horses 
Um, they were domesticated in Eurasia, and uh, donkeys were domesticated in Africa, um, but they actually cannot reproduce. And so sometimes we have um, cases where hybrid vigor doesn't extend across the whole spectrum here. And this is related to more the chromosomal phenomenon when it comes to donkeys now, uh, and horses. They have different chromosome numbers. I mentioned, I, I mentioned earlier the autosomal chromosomes, where they have a dominant and recessive gene, or dominant-dominant, or recessive-recessive. That's because we have a pair of chromosomes, and you need a pair in diploid organisms so that one side can go to uh, the sperm um, uh, when they are producing uh, gametes, so sperm or egg. They need to have one copy of each, so when they form a, an embryo, they can have a diploid organism. Unfortunately, what happens is if you breed a horse which has uh, 64 chromosomes to a donkey which has a 62 chromosomes, you produce an animal with 63 chromosomes. So that is 32 uh, pairs and 31 pairs. And so you get an animal with an uneven number of chromosomes, and that's the mule. So mules have been sometimes documented to be able to breed, but this does not seem to be scientifically validated. Um, what this means is that donkeys and horses cannot form fertile hybrid offspring. And this is a huge disadvantage for people who want to breed mules. It means you kind of have to keep horses and donkeys around in some numbers. Um, but it also has led to some interesting interpretations of that. Now, people have been breeding mules for basically as long as horses and donkeys have been around in the same place at the same time. It seems to have been done in Asia Minor and the uh, Levant for thousands of years. We actually know from the, uh, the Hebrew Bible that um, in Leviticus it prohibits the um, breeding of mules altogether in Leviticus. Um, it's also been mentioned in the, um, the I think it's the Iliad, uh, in Homer for sure, uh, that uh, they mention mules. So we know that they've been breeding for hundreds and, and thousands of years in that part of the world. And of course they, they had a reputation for being amazing working animals, but they also had negative connotations as well. The Greek word hybrid comes from two different sor source words. One is hybrida, which is a a hybrid that's formed between a domesticated sow and a wild boar, so kind of a pig. Um, but it also comes from the Greek word hubris, which is um, excessive pride, uh, literally spitting in the face of God, basically. So when you're producing hybrids, you're producing something that you're, you're, you're playing God, is the idea. And making and breeding mules, is, it, it kind of has this connotation that you're, you're doing something unnatural, beyond what the gods would have done. Um, so there is that reputation as well. Uh, there's also a few other things to keep in mind too. Um, there's this idea of telogeny, which is, um, this is going to sound perverse and bizarre, but I, I should make a whole video about this, but it's this idea that if you breed a female animal to a male animal, the subsequent offspring bred from other males will have the quality of the first male. This doesn't have much scientific backing from Mendelian genetics, although it may have some backing from epigenetics, and it's pretty controversial that way. Um, but in large part, it, if there is an effect, it's not very large. Um, but there is a belief that if you bred a mare to a donkey, it's going to only produce mules for the rest of its life. So people didn't like breeding their mares to donkeys for centuries because of this. Um, there's also the belief that um, purebred anim animals were superior. And before Mendelian genetics, this was the common thought that uh, if you have purebred lines, you're able to control the genetics in there, and you can have very predictable offspring. This is, of course, um, results in what's called inbreeding depression. Uh, now, inbreeding depression is when you get lots of recessive traits because if you breed individuals together for too long um, and you get inbreeding in the lines, you get increased numbers of recessive genes, and this can often be disease states. Like I mentioned with the dominance phenomenon, having a dominant gene may be more healthy than a recessive gene. Well, if you breed lots of individuals together, eventually those dominant genes are going to be lost and you're going to get a lot of recessive genes popping up. And so this is a big problem that people didn't recognize until Mendelian genetics became well known in the 20th century. Um, so there was, but there was a belief for a long time that purebred animals were superior. And of course, I'm talking about animals, but people naturally started to associate this with human beings. Now, I'm not going to say the word, but there have been, of course, the, word, the term mule has been applied to human beings from different ethnic or racial backgrounds. Um, people who come from multiple backgrounds, uh, they were associated with the traits that are ascribed to mules. You know, they are, you know, might be harder working or longer living, 
but also they're more aggressive and stubborn and that kind of thing. And these are harmful racial stereotypes, of course, um, but it's also human beings are extremely genetically similar to each other. We came from a very small founder population of uh, homonyms living, uh, you know, 70,000 years ago, apparently. Um, but the, the bottleneck of human genetic diversity limits the actual scope of how much hybrid vigor you could get if you crossbred people together. So, but that doesn't stop people from making these comparisons. And this is, of course, how the Europeans saw themselves when they were colonizing the world. So uh, the ideas behind hybrid vigor, they have had this negative racial connotation. I should point out too, when I say superior genes, there's no such thing as a superior gene objectively. This is a subjective analysis. And when you're looking at an animal, you may want an animal that can reproduce, in which case the mule is not the animal you're looking for. Um, but if you want a working animal, a mule may be exactly the kind of thing that you're looking for for that kind of purpose. So that all being said, um, when we think about hybrid vigor, it is a genetic phenomenon that has been noted by animal breeders. Um, it relates to the way that we think about mules, and of course the way that we think about mules is often tied up in our societal classifications. So that all being said, it's an interesting concept. I hope you learned a little bit about genetics and maybe a little bit about hybrid vigor, maybe a little bit about mules too. Um, if you like this video, leave a comment and a like below. Um, check out the stuff we're doing at the Memory School. We've got a couple of courses coming up this fall. It should be super cool, and I'm going to be taking uh, at least one of them. So. Check that out, and if you have any questions, of course, shoot me up on my blue sky, um, and I will see you next time. Peace.